Good evening. I'm Sharon Leibowitz, and I'm here to welcome you to this evening's program. I'm class of 91 GSAP, Vice Chair of the Columbia Alumni Leaders Weekend Planning Committee, President of the GSAP Alumni Association, and I'm also a member of the CAA Board of Directors. So on behalf of the CAA, welcome to all of you to our ninth annual Leaders Weekend. This year, Leaders Weekend brings nearly 400 alumni leaders from across the country and around the globe to share best practices and exchange ideas. I know there are many alumni leaders in the audience tonight, so whether you're a school-based volunteer or a CAA volunteer, please stand and be recognized. Anybody? For those of you who presently do not volunteer, I encourage you to take this opportunity to speak with the volunteers around you and think how you may give back. Um, this evening, you're going to hear the word partnership a lot, because that's a key goal of the weekend. As a society, we need to think how we partner across disciplines to create results. Tonight's panel is about the 21st century city, and we will be looking at how we partner in a more tangible way. Um, from experience, we know that working across disciplines helps us do better every day. Our three panelists are recognized thought leaders in their fields. Jamie Bennett, class of 95, Columbia College, is Chief of Staff, National Endowment for the Arts. Kate Gillespie, 88 GSAP, is Director of Planning at Perez, and Sheena Wright, uh, 90 College, 94 Law, is the um, president and CEO of United Way. Leading us through our discussion tonight is Diane Brady. Not a thought leader. <laughs> <laughs> um, class of 90 Journalism. Diane is the senior content editor of Bloomberg Businessweek. So without further ado, I turn you over to Diane. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I feel bad for the people over there, not that you have to see me, but um, so everybody who gave money last year raised their hands. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Yay, you're not even, well, no, not on stage. Yes. Well, no, that's I did. Um, this is going to be a great conversation. We're talking about urban transformation. We're going to have a chance to see some slides, so thank you for that. We'll have a show. And then we're going to really have some debate on what works and what we'd like to see, where cities are headed, positive and negative. So it'll be challenges, I think, and some of the opportunities. And I'm going to start by just looking a little bit at what the urban landscape is like for you, the vision that you have. We're going to start with our furloughed worker here, yeah. um, who has been, uh, I think your Blackberry was locked up, so how you're coping, I'm not sure. But we have here um, somebody from the front lines of the shutdown to tell us a little bit about what you've been doing at the National Endowment for the Arts and the types of partnerships you're forming. So, sure. Jamie, I'll start with you. Well, thanks so much. Um, I came to the NEA about four years ago uh, in 2009 at the beginning of the Obama administration, and I arrived there having worked in New York City government for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, um, so doing similar work on the local level for about three years before that. And our chairman at the NEA was a guy called Rocco Landisman, who some of you may know as a Broadway producer. Uh, he owns five Broadway theaters, Hugh Johnson Theaters. And he always sort of talked about theater as being the most collaborative of the arts, that it's really in theater productions that you need people sort of across disciplines coming together and you need the composers and the authors and the actors and the designers and everyone coming together to work. So he sort of arrived at the NEA with that as his mindset. And rather than deciding to sort of stake his claim by how large the NEA's budget was, he really saw his job as making sure that every single federal agency felt a responsibility to take care of the arts. So he spent his time going around to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, the was Environmental he Protection. Was with open arms? Well, so what's interesting is he actually was, yeah. because he didn't show up and say, hey, we're the arts, we need more money. 
And oftentimes when you sort of talk about arts fundraising, unfortunately that's our opening gambit. We sort of say, we really want to put on a play, we don't have enough money, can you give us some? And that's not really leading from such a powerful position. So instead what Rocco really did was he came and talked about what the arts could bring to the table. And he came to arm with uh, research. There are two professors at the University of Pennsylvania, Mark Stern and Susan Seifert, who actually have studied the arts in communities in depth and have demonstrated the ways that the arts can lead to social cohesion, the way it can increase child welfare, the way it can actually fight poverty. Um, they've also found, they have some preliminary findings from Baltimore and Philadelphia, that the arts can actually create diverse neighborhoods. So contrary to the sort of gentrification myth or experience, depending on where you uh, fall in, uh, in that debate, they've actually discovered that neighborhoods with the greatest incidence of cultural institutions are the most economically, racially, uh, and ethnically diverse. So armed with this, we sort of came forward and didn't say to Secretary Donovan at Housing and Urban Development, here's what we need money for, give it to us. We said, let us help you. HUD sees their job as creating complete communities that are inclusive of everyone. And we said, great, let us show you how the arts can bring people into place, how they can make them stay there, and how they can sort of enliven the streetscapes. Are there any particular successes before we um, move on to Kate, that, or any unusual partnerships that you think might be counterintuitive when people think of well, NEA? So, so the HUD one, for instance, was we ended up having the arts explicitly included in a $100 million notice of funding availability for regional plans. Mm. So for the first time in, I think, HUD's history, they actually said the arts are welcome to the table, and we explicitly want them as one of the voices at the table talking about the shape of our future communities. In the Department of Agriculture, they actually wanted to partner, us, partner with us around urban design issues. And when you're doing, um, I shouldn't say urban design, more rural design issues, and the difference is when you're dealing in rural settings, you sort of need to create campfire moments, right? The definition of rural are people who live far apart. And so you need them to come fires. together. And have open <laughs> fires. Um, but you need these moments for them to come together. And Secretary Vilsack really saw the arts as doing what about that. about defense? Department of Defense, we've got two different things with them. We have 2,000 museums across the United States that open their doors for free to every active duty military family all summer long. And they do this as a way of incorporating the military families more strongly into their communities because so many military families move all the time. This was a chance for them to get to know their communities. And then at Walter Reed, which is the major, one of the major uh, military hospitals, we've actually incorporated the arts into the patient's daily prescription of treatment. So they see their psychopharmacologist, they see their physical therapist, then they also do writing, they do um, visual arts, they do music making. And we actually have some interesting research that's moving forward with that. So pretty much everywhere we landed, everywhere we showed up, we were able to sort of land some sort of partnership. So I think this is a moment where the federal government is open to sort of common sense and joint solutions <laughs> because this, well, no, because no, this is an era right. of decreasing <laughs> resources. And so we need to do more well, with no, lots. We'll get to the pain yes. points, but I think you're right. There's been some great creativity we've right. seen there. I'm gonna go now to Kate. Um, and I don't know if you want to come over here and tell us, I mean, or if you want to pace, you can pace. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's a theater here, theater in the round. And, you know, especially your work at Perez, you've done a lot on resiliency, you're an urban planner, and tell us a little bit about what's happening in terms of the partnerships and where some of the needs are. Okay. <clears throat> well, I've been in search of perfect communities around the country. I've lived not only in New York, after graduating from GSAP, but in Seattle, in Anchorage, Alaska, San Francisco, spent a few miserable months in the Midwest, and there's a reason why. There's a reason why, and that's because I was away from the coast. All of the rest of my life, I've lived on the coast. Most recently, before coming to New York in May, I was living in New Orleans. So I've, I've almost circled the country, haven't lived in Hawaii yet. <clears throat> this is supposed to, oh, green arrow, okay. Is that where you live? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, some of these are. Um, so in the top left um, is some change that happened not long ago, almost a year ago, um, Bell Harbor. In the upper right uh, is what happened to one of my colleagues' homes after Katrina. 
So I did spend almost a year in New Orleans after Katrina um, working on recovery issues there. In the lower left, um, you're looking at um, Long Island and um, some damage that happened after Sandy. And then in the center is a project that we've been working on this year for the National Park Service, which is restoring buildings at Reese Park and at Sandy Hook in New Jersey. And in the lower right, you see what um, the storm did to a brick building with a wall that was, we say, white steep, three white steep, or about two feet thick of bricks. Those brick walls caved in with the waves and took out everything in their path for about 80 feet. <clears throat> so when I was in California, I had the opportunity to work on a study with AECOM and Arcatus called Adapting to Rising Tides. And it was really a groundbreaking study for me in that we were charged with looking at the impact of sea level rise of 16 inches and 55 inches. This was funded through the National Highway Association. The money passed on to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And from there, the goal of looking at the entire Bay Area was reduced to one county, Alameda County, which is where Oakland is. <clears throat> so this is the Bay Area. For those of you that aren't familiar, it's nine counties. Zooming in, San Francisco Bay, and on the right side is Alameda County. It's a long, narrow county um, bounded by hills, not quite mountains, on the east side and the bay on the west. <clears throat> and I'm focusing here on downtown Oakland as well as um, the Inner Harbor area. So, the map on the left shows you the impacts of sea level rise. 16 inches, the light blue, the dark blue is a 55 inch rise. And the significance of this is that the, there's a huge impact on the infrastructure. On the upper right, you're looking at the new Bay Bridge. It just opened, this photo's a couple of years old now. But um, if you can imagine at the top of the riprap um, is about 55 inches. So this new highway that we spent three and a half billion dollars to build this bridge connecting um, halfway to San Francisco from Oakland um, is going to be at risk of flooding in 50 years. <clears throat> the lower um, slide is showing you the Amtrak station uh, about half of the Amtrak right-of-way through, um, um, through Alameda County would be underwater. The airport, all of the airport would be underwater with a 55-inch sea level rise. The only part that might not be is the terminal, but to get there, the roadways are all flooded, the runways are flooded. Below that is Highway I-880, which is the main trucking transportation corridor moving produce from the Central Valley out to rail and, and other um, shipping interests. It would be underwater. Um, the tunnels that connect Oakland to San Francisco or to Alameda, um, the tunnel I, that I'm speaking of connecting San Francisco would be the BART tunnel, but um, going to Alameda, we also have two tunnels. Both of those would be underwater. Right now, there are no floodgates to keep the waters from, from flowing in. The lower right is a ferry station, ferry dock, again, from Alameda to San Francisco. So the shoreline and um, the facility itself would be underwater. Bridges, same thing. This is a drawbridge. Um, if you see the high water line, and then imagine 55 inches, all of the supporting structures would be underwater. And then the lower slide is showing you Emeryville, which is the main tax base for the city of Emeryville with these large office buildings. While the majority of the buildings would be above water, certainly their lobbies are at risk of being flooded. 
So zooming back out to the rest of the country, wanted to take a quick look at um, how our, our government has been funding infrastructure. And the chart on the left shows historically um, that during recessions, we've had a spike up. And then after the recession, the revenue falls back down. The chart on the lower right is showing the budget proposed um, for next year. And you can see that more than half of the discretionary funding of our government that doesn't go to social services or other mandated programs, over half of our discretionary income goes to the military. And who can find transportation? 3%? So it's a little larger and easier to see there. Last night, David Dixon from Goody Clancy talk, gave a, a TED talk just a few blocks away from here, and this is a slide that he used. Um, so looking at the gap in funding to deal with the issues of climate change. And this is what's surprising. So if the ice caps melt, what happens to our coastlines? Maybe Michigan's looking a lot better. <laughs> so those are the thoughts I wanted to bring tonight. I, I think when we're looking to the future, we need to start thinking about revenue streams and how we're making decisions as a country on where to spend our money and investing upfront before we have many more multi-billion dollar catastrophes. So, Thank you very much, Kate. And as you're sitting down before, I'm not going to have uh, Sheena immediately continue on that happy note. I want you to talk about <laughs> what, given the realities that we're facing in terms of, you know, budget shortfalls, debt ceilings, everything else, what do you think is the most realistic or creative way to be dealing with what we realize is an infrastructure gap? Can you give us some sense from, and where your favorite city was that you lived in? So. Okay. <laughs> Gosh, well, something that's, I think, challenging in this country is that we are so diverse in our viewpoints and our priorities. And having traveled to Amsterdam a couple of years ago for an international water conference, I found that Amsterdam has national planning objectives and they have national values. Mm -hmm. And this is something that our country has never looked at is what's most important to us as a population? What do we want our future to be? How do we want to invest our money together? And that's a national dialogue that I, I think needs to happen because it gets us out of the mode of different parties. Um, I can't remember how many parties the Netherlands has, but it's many more than two or three or 10. It's in the dozens yet they have national goals and objectives, which we don't. And I think if we moved in that direction and stepped away from party, um, partisan politics, that- Dare to dream. Yes. <laughs> Not the private sector? Well, the private you know, there's sector- Because there's a whole study on resilience post-Sandy in New York, and there's you know, many different players being brought to the table. And, Feel free to jump in, but I'm just curious before we move on, you don't see them playing a major role, the private sector in whatever form, individuals, companies? I do, and I think that's happening in technology. I think that's looking at new solutions. To build seawalls as um, the Netherlands has done is a huge undertaking, but there are other solutions in building seawalls and using recycled materials in building um, artificial berms that slow the rush of the sea. Um, the difference is that we have to think about, is it important to have private views of the water or provide safety to communities? Some of the challenges we're seeing in, in communities that decide that they want to embrace having seawalls and other protections is that some neighbors want to hold out and don't want to participate. And when they do, that creates new inlets for the water to intrude further inland. 
So we're just moving the problem. That's fair enough. And we will talk about branding opportunities. But no, but, um, <laughs> so Sheena, you are coming up on your one year anniversary on yeah. the job. I was having flashbacks. I, you know, no <laughs> and I think Sandy happened day one, did day it not? Day one, day one. So, um, so here you are, you know, in terms of, tell us a little bit about what you found coming to the United Way. Um, and in terms of just the opportunities that presented themselves and some of the challenges that you did, might not have expected. Sure. Um, like I said, that was absolutely, I felt some flashbacks there, um, walking into a brand new job the day that, you know, one of the biggest superstorms hits uh, this city and immediately uh, called into action. You know, United Way of New York City was asked uh, on day two of my, of my tenure to raise a fund for the entire region and to manage the um, disaster relief efforts on the ground in Coney Island. So deploying 3,000 volunteers and really, really um, um, being engaged. But I think something that Jamie said as well as Kate are some core points that really came out in those first days and I think really speak to this whole concept of partnership. Um, you know, looking at Kate's slides, sometimes the problems feel intractable, so big, so enormous. How can we wrap our arms around it? And people just get very comfortable in their silos and can say, well, I can think of this. But the whole concept of having big, broad goals and really looking at what are the things we all care about and we can agree on and that we share is, a, is a, I think, a very important baseline for developing meaningful partnerships to solve those things that just seem unsolvable. What do you mean by silos? I mean, are these silos like, you know, private? Is, is it silos around um, neighborhoods? I mean, there's all kinds of silos that a United Way would encounter. So what were the ones right. that you I saw? mean, you know, we sit in the, at, at a very unique nexus uh, between uh, the nonprofit community. We are been in, investing and engaged in and partnering and co-creating programs with probably 5,000 nonprofits in the city of New York. So we know what works, what doesn't work directly on the front lines. We also have a very unique and very strong relationship with corporate America. United Way of New York City was created by corporate America. It was the corporate titans of the day that sat around the table right after the Great Depression. And actually there was a huge storm in 1938 as well. And, and the infrastructure of the social safety net was so fractured, the corporate community said, what can, what's our role in this partnership and keeping New York City strong and resilient? What should we do about it? And so that's where they put their philanthropy to work. And then we also sit uh, very closely connected to government and, and our ability to influence policy and not just invest in programs on the ground that are really helping people on the front lines, but taking that knowledge and expertise and being able to change the system and really change policy to impact as many people as possible to really achieve scale. And so, you know, one of the things we found is that these three sectors often don't communicate with one another when there is, uh, and there are very clear shared goals that each has, and we're not getting the best of each to the table to really plot out, you know, connect the dots and just really talk through sensible solutions. You know, one, one quick example is, you know, one of the, we talk about unemployment and poverty and hunger and there are all these issues that we deal with. Um, and, and one of the issues is that, you know, there's a skills gap. We're gonna have a quarter of a million jobs and we don't have the people to fill those jobs. So there's a disconnect obviously between what's happening in our schools, what's happening with our workforce development providers. But we haven't set the table, really, to sit down with business and say, what kind of skills do we need to teach our kids in school? What specifically should the workforce development community be training people to do? Because that's gonna save you, business community, a lot of money on your training and your retention if we can make a smaller investment down the chain. But we've gotta sit at the table together and talk it through and map it out and get it done. 
And then we've got to make sure that government comes in when they need to. There's um, you know, things like P-TECH, I'm thinking of with yeah. IBM, where you've seen more involvement of corporations in, in the public high school system. Is that a model that you think you hope just a thousand flowers bloom and we'll see it all over the place? That's a great model, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful model. And, and, the, and the key is how do you scale these things? Because P-TECH is one school, it's a great school, there are going to be a dozen you know, that are industry specific, but we have 1,600 schools in New York City. Yeah. So you know, we've got to get there faster. Um, and so that's one of the things that we just have to be more innovative and think bigger and, so that we can get there. And I think one of the things that Jamie said about partnership is that everybody in the partnership, you have to know what you bring to the table. You know, NEA knew what they brought to the table. There was value and they put it on the line, and they also knew what they needed to get out of it. And so if each sector respects one another, if the corporate sector respects what the nonprofit sector brings to the table, and we respect what government brings to the table when they're not shut down, you know, we can, uh, we can really well, get some stuff and done. And I want to talk about that a bit, and we will be involving, I'm sure we'll have some lively input from the audience, but the city seems to be in some ways a more flexible, nimble, uh, beast, certainly than anything in the 202 area code, and you know, and the state, and so I think that to some extent we're seeing regions come together, yes. and that's where people are focusing their energies. But I want to get to um, NEA in part because I was reading the paper, and good news, you know, your survey that came out, which found that there was across the board lower public participation in the arts. We're going to, you know, we're going to the museum less often, to the theater less often. What does that say about the appetite, and is that just simply that we're shifting how we consume the arts, or how, is that good news, bad so, news? I wanna put you in the mood. For sure, absolutely. So, I, so um, for those of you who don't know, the NEA every about four years works with the Census Department, and we release the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts. So the Census administers it, it measures arts participation for every American adult. And we have five flavors of arts participation. There's attendance at live events, events like jazz at uh, Lincoln Center. There's making and sharing art, so the things you do at home, doing photography, doing things on Pinterest or YouTube. There's arts learning. There's consumption by electronic media. And then there's reading, which because it's, it's sort of like live attendance, but sort of different. And what's been interesting is we were able to release that a couple weeks before the government shut down. And the stories that came out about it focused on attendance at plays, uh, musicals, and museums, all of which have declined. But one of the things we were talking about backstage that I think is much more interesting is that people's patterns are really changing. I think historically the arts often operated like churches. There was sort of a set thing they did at a set time in a set place, and they did it once a week, and they didn't care if 100 people came or they didn't care if one person came. They were gonna sort of keep doing the same thing. And there's an extraordinary woman called Elizabeth Streb, who's a dancer and choreographer here uh, in Brooklyn. And she talked about not wanting to build a cathedral, but wanting to build a 7-Eleven. Mm. Something that was always open, that had something that Sounds almost exhausting. everyone needed, and that you could <laughs> stop by whenever you right. wanted something. And so Dance. if yeah. we're, right, but you actually can. You can show up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and if they're having an open rehearsal, you can stop in and see it. If they're having a class and there's room in the class, you can join. She really has sort of taken this. And, and their there, revenues have gone up as and, a result? And the revenues or? have gone up and the attendance have gone up. There are some theaters on the West Coast that are actually moving to something like a gym or a Netflix model, where you pay a monthly thing on your credit card and you can consume as much or as little as you want. And they've seen a big uptick. But what's interesting when you sort of dive into the numbers, you're noticing that people are consuming the arts more as a part of their everyday life. So they want things on their own schedules, they want things that can sort of fit into their lives. And the story that I think is coming out of this is that the arts are gonna be much more an integrated part of our communities. And it's not gonna be that sort of, you know, I have a Thursday night subscription series, so art is that thing I do on Thursday nights at 7.30 in, at the uh, New York State Theater. And instead, you're gonna sort of see it infusing. One of the things I think Sheena and I were talking a little bit about is that if you look at the Knight Foundation worked with Gallup to do something called the Soul of the Community Survey to find out what attracts people, not what, it, sorry, what attaches people to place. What is the thing that sort of drives yeah. community attachment? And the three top findings for what drives community attachment are social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. 
in other words, the arts. So the arts are what make people fall in love with a place and stay there. And I think sort of to your point about we may be seeing more bright spots on the local level, and to Sheena's point about you know, cities really can come together around shared agendas, if you care about a place, you care about everything about that place. You care about the poor people, you care about the rich people, you care about the schools, you care about resilience and recovery. And I think the arts can play a really important role in that. Well, and you're seeing a lot of interest in things like digital creatives sure. and, and these hubs that people are trying to create where you can have like the Etsy fashion show mm -hmm. and such. To what extent um, does that change how you look at partnerships, who your partners are, what the role is of NEA? Have you, cha have you transformed your own view of yourself given how people are changing their sure. own patterns? So I think I can actually echo Sheena's point about you sort of need no, to know. No, there's gonna be conflict. <laughs> it's like entertainment. <laughs> it's a conflict. Right. Yeah, it's like, like set. If I could wildly agree with Sheena. Oh, I'll okay. do it that way. Um, Passion but, is good. Passion. But I think going in, sort of knowing what you bring to the table, what the common goal is, and knowing the sort of things you don't need to worry about are sort of the key factors for partnership. And there's an extraordinary woman called Madeline Grinstein who runs a museum in the Midwest. I'm sorry about I that. I know, well, there's gonna um, be it's something. In, it's in Throw Chicago, so at least it's on a body of water. <laughs> um, but she talked about the fact that as people sort of wanna curate for themselves and create their own experiences, she needs to retain her expertise while relinquishing control. So she's, I'm never gonna know as much about contemporary art as Madeline Grinstein, but I'm still entitled to my own experience of it. So I think that balance about sort of letting, you know, not all art is created equal and not all art is for everyone. Um, there was a, there's an amazing woman called Commander McGuire who runs um, the, the program at the Walter Reed Medical yeah. Center. And she was doing a panel about arts integration and someone, a former dancer from New York City Ballet, Damien Wetzel, asked the question. He said, well, why haven't you incorporated dance into your work with the Marines? And she gave my favorite answer I think anyone's ever given. She said, well, we think that the arts are a lot like that little black dress that's hanging in your closet. It's perfect for every occasion, but one size doesn't fit all. And I think when she's working with a group of Marines, asking them to do ballet exercises is maybe not the most effective first. They might be form. more modern. Right, maybe, right, right exactly. They're more sort of most kind of hammer, the Graham um, sort of train thing. So I think not expecting every arts experience of being all things to all people, and that's kind of that equal footing you need to come in. You know, as you said with P-TECH, one company can make a huge difference for one school, mm -hmm. but they're the other 1.1 million New York City public school children right. who also need something. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about, and Kate, weigh in, or Sheena, in terms of just when we look at infrastructure and climate and resilience, we do focus a lot on the seawalls and the actual sort of physical buildings. What about the resilience of people? Yes. And, and I'm curious to what extent we pay attention to that and to what extent there may be creative partnerships because the reality of what resilience is about is that you cannot predict anymore. It's about coping with the unknowable and so that would seem to suggest that it's not just simply building bigger, stronger highways, it's making people that can bend. I'm curious what you see being done there or Sheena, you know, what you see being done, but Kay, I'll start with you. Okay, well, there was a great illustration in the Rockaways, um, the Rockaway Surf Club, I believe it's called, where before first responders came, people just gravitated there because it was a popular place, they had room, um, and it was safe. People brought food for each other um, and supported each other and shared resources because so many people were displaced. And so it was a great model of creating community and building on those relationships with people and helping each other. Had nothing to do with waiting for government to come and but help. But is it serendipity? Can you actually foster that? I mean, even as an urban planner, or, you know, New York is famously a city. In fact, we just won an award in Istanbul for being the most age-friendly city. Who mm -hmm. knew? But we are. <laughs> so, um, so I think that there's, you know, this is a community that's very integrated residentially and people think neighborhood by neighborhood. I don't know if that's something that you think about or we build or who the partners are if it requires new partners coming to the table. Gina. Well, I think certainly what we found is that there are institutions that exist 
already in neighborhoods and communities that people go to every day for help, whether it's the church or the food pantry or the after school program. And so investing in the people and the, and the ability for preparedness for future, because we know, you know, we had a tornado warning last week. There's something we, right around the that. corner. Yes. Yeah, right? Did you guys, did you know? Yes. There was a tornado yes. warning. Yes, I was not here. So I was looking fair. for it. I was yeah. like, come on, <laughs> not, not again. Um, and, and so there are institutions that exist in communities. They're on the front lines day in and day out, and they know who everybody is. And so an investment and a continued investment in those institutions that are supporting the people in those communities is something that's important. We did not get federal dollars, um, and now they're even held up even more, and, and, a, and, and federal response to Sandy for about six months. It was those nonprofit organizations that have been on the front lines day in and day out that stood in the gap and, and did that, you know, collection of resources, redistribution of resources, helping rebuild and hold the neighborhoods and communities together. And so I think a lot of times, and, and you said a little bit about gentrification, I live in Harlem. Um, when I went to Columbia, we said that Columbia was in Harlem. Actually, I said it, but uh, <laughs> Harlem actually starts on 110th Street, but it's Morningside Heights. And, um, and you said something you know, about gentrification. And, uh, and I worked at a community development corporation working on the you know, kind of revitalization of that community for, for, for a decade. Um, and, and so, and now I forgot, I lost my th train of thoughts, <laughs> but. Let me, I, I want to pivot off that to some extent because, you know, even when you talk about the different communities, we've seen a growing income divide mm -hmm. and, and when you have that, obviously you've got a pool of people who have an incredible amount of money and can spread largesse. To what extent is that an opportunity? To what extent are they more marginalized um, people in cities? Are their voices, their needs being heard? Because I think I, I, that's interesting to me even the corporate involvement has changed a lot. People right. want to attach to their own you know, projects now versus undifferentiated. So give me a sense of sort of as you've seen the makeup of the city and the income distribution shift, how has that changed the challenges right. that you have? I remember my point, and thank you for that. But <laughs> like and it's connected to that, that question. But as we thought about city building in New yeah. York and in, and in many places in, in urban development, we thought about place and we didn't think about the people who were there. So we invested in you know, uh, economic revitalization and you know, buildings and housing and, and stores and other infrastructure projects, but we didn't invest in ensuring that the people who were there had better educational opportunities and workforce development opportunities and social services and income support so they, they could grow with the communities that had this big infrastructure investment. So if you have the investment in the place and not the people, you're going to have these huge disparities. What's okay. going to happen is that those people are going to be pushed out because they don't have what they need to take advantage of the current opportunity. I'm going to ask if there's questions in the audience. I could keep going, and I have no concept of the time here. So, um, but if you, I think we have mics. Is that right? Um, or you can project. I see somebody in the second row raising their hand there, and also identify yourself, what year you graduated, how much money you, no, you don't, but uh, <laughs> give, us, uh, give us some sense of, of where you're coming from as you, so I'm now pointing to somebody in the second row there, um, if you want to raise, and if there is no mic, I, I will simply talking. repeat. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi. Oh. Uh, my name is Susan Gedalson. I went to Barnard, to SEPA, and got a PhD, so I have lots of questions. Yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> First of all, thank you for this forum. It's uh, really worthwhile. Uh, and there's one area that you may not have uh, touched on sufficiently yet, and that is when you talk about the declining attendance at arts events, uh, there's a whole other story about uh, the social media and interaction and people watching Opera HD and so forth. And, uh, and also the, the desire uh, for more input. I, I feel this, I listen to QXR all the time, 
and they're always encouraging people to uh, get on the, the website and, and give their opinions and so right. forth. Tweet well, this is a mayor. revolution in itself. Mm -hmm. So please talk more about yeah. this. Sure. I think that's a good point. And let me also add within that, you know, the whole area of big data and how data can transform, you know, technology, how people get involved. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that's most interesting to me about the survey of public participation, the arts that we released, is if you look at arts consumption by electronic media, and within that we include TV and radio, but we also include mobile handheld devices, the internet, the sort of full spectrum. One of the most interesting findings, I think, is that essentially all racial ethnic patterns of arts participation there's no difference among them. So electronic consumption of the arts actually erases what's largely been a divide in terms of live attendance. And then just because I uh, have, or I once again may someday have oversight over the NEA's public affairs department, I just want to underscore that we've seen some, de some um, declines in some arts attendance. That's not to say overall Americans' arts participation You'll still is have dipping. Your job. I will someday, <laughs> God willing, inshallah. Um, so anyway, so I just—it's absolutely important. And one of the earlier reports we released actually found that people who consume the arts by electronic media are twice as likely to also attend arts events live and also to attend and experiment with a greater variety of them. So I think a lot of our arts organizations are scared of electronic media. And, and if you look at it historically, it's fascinating, right? Museums were terrified when photography was invented because once we were going to publish catalogs of paintings, no one was ever going to go to a museum again. When records came out, live musicians got totally terrified. And so every time there's a sort of technology revolution, the arts community gets scared again rather than embracing it. But who buys more records than people who go to arts events? And, you know, they're absolutely connected. And then one of the things that I think, just to sort of pivot from that to Sheena's last point, is that notion of sort of not displacing people that's largely related, I think, a lot of it, to folks' status as renters. Mm -hmm. And that if you're a renter in a community and the property values, I'm a renter, when property values go up in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., it actually makes it difficult for me to stay there. But if we create pathways to ownership, you actually benefit from those increases. And so I think connecting people in place becomes really, really important because then people can prosper with the places. And to your point, if you look at those in silos and you're not looking at the two yeah. of them together, that gets really sort of dangerous and scary. Do we have any other questions? And Kate, any, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about also creative uses of technology from, you know, people, for example, crowdsourcing when infrastructure is going down. I mean, there's a lot of dashboards now people are doing. Is that something you work on? Or? It is, and there are some wonderful tools to increase public participation. The use of handheld devices has just been amazing. How many people have apps on their phones? I don't, because I have a Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> Almost no, everyone raised their hand. Yeah. So um, there are some great applications for community involvement which allow polling in ways that we've not had before. And submitting statements of problems. Some cities are using apps now to report potholes. And then you get a report back when it's fixed. So this is amazing because to see the responsiveness rather than just calling a helpline and leaving a message yeah. and wondering why didn't they ever fix it but to actually get confirmation that someone listened is remarkable. Yeah, I think so. So I'm not uh, seeing here, but I know there's another question. Go ahead. Hi. And Hi. just introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Yumi Ko, uh, class of 93. I was an art history major and then, of course, very naturally have spent the past 20 years in finance. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question to ask you regarding the issue of government funding. I know, Jamie, this might be somewhat sensitive given your probably waiting for your paycheck, <laughs> but uh, what is the percentage, the what is the percentage that currently comes from the government in terms of your funding today, and, and where do you see that percentage going five to ten years from now? Sure, to the NEA? Yeah, we're 100, we're 100, understood, oh, right. so, so for we're you, 100 the, rele the relevant yeah. question is, just given what we're seeing with the budget and the debt ceiling, et cetera, do you see your budget decreasing rapidly and why? And how can we help you 
support that? Sure. So the two parts of the answer I'll give to that is for the last two years, for fiscal 13 and for fiscal 14, the president has proposed an increase to the NEA's budget. Relatively modest, about $7.3 million. But still, I think given everything that's going on, there's huge sort of symbolic import to that. The other thing I'll say in terms of the budget discussions and the battles that are going on, um, I always have mixed feelings about saying this, but the huge victory, I think, for the arts is that we're not being singled out. We're being treated like everyone else. So when the sequestration cuts hit, we took the exact same 5% hit that every other federal agency took on its discretionary spending. So I don't see the culture wars being embedded in the current budget discussions in the way that they were in the past. And I actually am very hopeful about that. Um, I haven't followed the New York City budget as closely uh, since I left, but again, Mayor Bloomberg, at least during the time I was there and following the budget, he and the city council did do significant investments in the city as well. And to Kate's point, New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs, when I left, was managing a billion dollars in capital funding for cultural organizations. So New York City had budgeted in its 10-year capital plan a billion dollars for cultural infrastructure over the years. But I would say the flip to that, the rest of the nonprofit sector, certainly uh, I, had, I was in a meeting this week with 50 leaders of, of some of the most significant nonprofits in the city of New York, and their government funding is shrinking you know, exponentially, and there is a need for the private sector to fill in the gap, because these organizations are doing what government is not can't or won't, and so they are fulfilling you know, the promise of keeping the community safe and people fed and all these other things, and, uh, and that pie is shrinking exponentially. So, so that's why we need that partnership. I think you're right, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it to 10 seconds. <laughs> It'll fall, maybe you can get 15, but give us, uh, give us each, you know, we have to end off, and I hope we can continue the discussion um, afterward, but we're going to have another presentation, which I think will be really intriguing and help set the stage as well, is give us your sense of, since we're talking about the 21st century city, give us your ideal, give us your vision of where you'd like to see us. And you can put it, you can do the far future, you can do the near future, but give us a sense of what, what the potential is that you see and, and just where you hope we are, say, 10 years from now in terms of your role or the arts or just in general? Sure, so I, my, my hope and dream for the arts is that, is sort of um, building on my budget question, that we begin to think of ourselves like everybody else and that we're at the table when there are discussions about resiliency and mitigation and prevention and response and all of that, and that we're seeing ourselves both as contributing to them as well as a sector that the government is responsible for and takes care of. And I think the arts have often sort of imposed an exile in ourselves where we sort of set ourselves apart and there are huge housing issues that are very important to artists and arts workers. Yeah. And yet we don't ally ourselves with the arts community, with the housing conversation or the community development conversation. So I think we need to get out of our silo and start connecting with the other sectors um, and be part of the solution and okay. be part of the sort of caring Great. society. Kate? I'd like to see more holistic communities. So we don't need to spend as many hours a day driving, commuting. Um, searching for the goods that we purchased, that neighborhoods would be like one of my favorite neighborhoods, you asked. Amsterdam? No, okay, <laughs> no, okay. No, no. Um, Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn is wonderful. We had access to transportation. Basically, everything we needed was in t within two blocks of the house. So the shops we went to, the fish stores, the pizzerias, the bakeries, the dry cleaners, the subway station, the park, the school, they were all within a two block radius of the house. And to me, that's my ideal neighborhood. Okay. Last word. Last word. Um, you know, we've obviously been just living through uh, an election. We're going to have a new government, a new mayor, two thirds of the city council new, um, four out of five borough presidents new. So we're going to have just really a, a, a new leadership in the city of New York. And I think. And you welcome that? Yeah, it's here. <laughs> so uh, ready or not, welcome or not, it, it is here. And I think, you know, having that shared vision, I mean, New York City is uh, amazing. It is one of the most diverse places 
um, you know, on the planet. We are going to be growing significantly over the next 10 years, but we are still one of the most segregated. We have the biggest income disparity. And you know, according to the Bloomberg administration's report that came out this year, 46% of New Yorkers are at or below the poverty line. So you know, in 10 years, it's going to take the business sector, the public sector, the nonprofit sector to come together, develop that shared vision uh, of New York for everybody, uh, and, and, and be caring. That was one of the words yep. that came out, that, that we all care about each other, and we understand that our destinies are connected. And, and we have everything we need to fix these problems. We just have to connect the dots and make it right. happen. We need your leadership to yeah, we, we, bang those. Well, please join me in thanking Jamie, Kate, and Sheena. Um, and I am. And me, thank, by all means. Uh, thank you, Columbia. Uh, and we're going to continue now, I believe, with Troy. Should we exit the stage no, to give please. a full? Oh, you want us to sit and see to. our facial? Exp oh, wait. Now we're being motioned off. So, oh, we're going to sit over here. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to steal the thunder. Because anyway, thank you very much. Okay. As they exit, please uh, join me in applauding them. What a fascinating presentation, and it raised lots of great. Great ideas that hopefully in the next five, ten years will come to fruition. I am Michael Kornfeld, a GSAS graduate and a chair of the Columbia Alumni Leaders Weekend Planning Committee and also a member of the CAA Board of Directors. And I want to thank our panelists, as we just said. And I believe that our next uh, portion of the program is going to deal with um, the CAA Arts Access Reception. Um, which will occur right after the following presentation. Um, I also understand that our speakers and moderator will be available during that reception, so please go up to them and ask them great questions and uh, thank them for their presentation. Um, as a primer for the souvenirs from the future exhibition awaiting us this evening's CAA reception, at this reception, adjunct professor and GSAP uh, alumnus from 2009, uh, Troy Terrien, will share highlights of experiments in motions and other cutting edge collaborations reimagining the future of cities. So without any further ado, Troy Terrien. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, and uh, thank you to everybody at the Columbia Alumni Association for putting together a really, really fantastic weekend of programming and a fantastic panel. It's, 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 a, it's a total honor to be able to share the stage that you just left, and also with this view, I hope somebody takes a picture and sends it to my mom, because it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, I'd also like to quickly thank Mark Wigley, uh, the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, um, where I studied and left and then came back because in my mind, I think he's more interesting than Google, which is where I'd otherwise be. Um, and so I'd like to tell a really quick story, um, a story about a project that we did last year at the Graduate School of Architecture, uh, Planning and Preservation in partnership with a uh, car manufacturer, Audi. Um, and so I realized that I'm the last programming between you all and an open bar, so I'm gonna set my alarm. <laughs> and I'm gonna go really fast, so don't blink. So in 2011, a fellow uh, GSAP alumnus and myself, Chris Barley, were asked by Architizer.com, an online social media platform for architects, to curate an exhibition for Audi, the car company. They had just started their Urban Future initiative and they wanted to make a splash in New York. So we came up with the idea of doing a 45 foot long glowing bent model of the city of Manhattan, or of Manhattan rather, part of the city of New York. We installed it in a uh, gallery in the Lower East Side. Um, and then we invited five young architects to come and carve into it and put together some ideas that they had for the future of the city in, in, in individuals and in collaboration with each other. Then we had a party. We invited 100 people and 500 showed up. And probably 200 of them are still angry at me for not being able to get in, so I hope you're not here. Um, at that party, we had a couple of famous architects. On the left is Charles Renfro, on the right, Bjarke Ingels. Um, a couple of Columbia grads. <laughs> Also, Charles, a fellow G-sapper, um, and we figured that would be it. 
Um, but at the end of the night, the powers that be from the Audi Urban Future Initiative came up to us and told us that we had just participated in a secret audition um, and that they were looking to expand their initiative into a realm of research and to be working with universities around the world and needed a partner to come up with an idea for a pilot program in America. Um, so they asked us for a, a, a written proposal on company letterhead the, by the end of the week. Um, so we were kind of excited and we went to sleep and we woke up and realized we didn't have a company. Um, and that we had jobs, and I was about to start working at Columbia. So I kept my job, and Chris quit his, and in the morning we went to an accountant and we started an LLC, and in the afternoon we contacted a graphic designer friend and had her do a logo for us, and then we made some letterhead and we wrote back to Audi. And we said, of course we want to work with you, and we think that you should work with Columbia. Um, so then we went to <laughs> So then we went to go see the dean, our former dean, Mark Wigley, um, and presented him the idea that, that previously he had done a partnership with Old Castle Building Envelope, which actually continues to this day, um, and a really successful one. And we asked him if he was interested in doing another round, this time with, with a car company, about mobility. And so he came, he spent, he was actually prudent and spent a few weeks thinking about the project and trying to figure out how it could actually integrate with the mandate of a school and maintain the autonomy of a research institution. Um, and being the great theorist that he was, he came back to us with a theory. Um, and the theory was that, of course, a car company is interested in the future of mobility, it's its business, but a university is interested in bigger things, or you might say first principles. And so he said, well, if we can go back and instead of talking about mobility, we can actually talk about motion. Maybe that's something we're interested in. And so he actually spent time over the summer coming up with the kind of intellectual framework for a project that's, that, that, if I can paraphrase, starts with the idea that motion has always been a part of culture. There's always been in the way that we visualize things, all the way back to the cave paintings, there's been the idea that motion is a core part of the way that we produce culture. Um, but in the late 19th century, um, right around the time of the ramping up of mechanization and particularly uh, the birth of the automobile, um, there was also an explosion in the way that we started to visualize motion through strobos uh, stroboscopic photography and so on. The experiments of Moybridge and Murray, you've seen the running horses probably, and this is a fencer. Um, and it's fairly well known uh, uh, to the art historians in the room, which I know we have one at least, um, that uh, this was a major influence in the art world. And so in the early avant-garde, in the early 20th century, this is a still from the futurist using photography um, to, to, to influence the way that they did painting, but it's less known the impact that it had on architecture. And actually the, 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 the idea from the dean was that it was actually the most symptomatic, the most famous architect of the 20th century, Le Corbusier, that first basically put a car against a building and said, well, which one do you think is more modern? Um, and so, just a little bit of Google image searching will show you that Le Corbusier loved his cars. This is the most famous architect of the 20th century. Um, it's almost impossible not to find him standing in or around a car. Um, and it's hard to find a picture of one of his buildings without a car in front of it. And so the theory was basically that the car made the building even more modern. Um, and so we did a bit of uh, research starting the project to try to find a kind of iconography of the 20th century of motion to see how other architects were kind of uh, affected by the way that motion was being uh, visualized in the 20th century. We then came up with the actual project, um, which roughly worked out to about a year, and it was three parts that each uh, took about one semester. And the idea was to start with a think tank that would allow us to gather the most amount of of, of, of information, the most amount of ideas to do with motion. Those would then be fed to a bunch of students, uh, 30 students in three design studios, that would then come down with a much more kind of precise idea that we could then have a kind of coming out party um, and be public with our ideas. And so, the, so going from focusing on ideas to actually spreading in terms of how we were connecting with people around the world. Um, so we came up with a name, which was Experiments in Motion. We went to a graphic designer and we told them we needed things that moved and so we came up with a responsive identity that could actually feel like it was in motion and actually in some cases was moving and we got started. So the first project, the first experiment, the think tank, had the idea of trying to connect to as many people around Columbia University that knew nothing about cars and nothing about buildings and ask them what they thought about motion. Um, when we thought we knew, so we went around and talked to counterinsurgency experts, um, physicists, and, uh, and then when we thought we knew a little something, we invited Audi back for dinner. So at Studio X New York, just uh, 50 blocks down the, the way, um, we invited them for dinner. 
We then did a planning session, and then we decided to open up to a much less intimate group of 60 people, where we had a dinner at the Sky Room of the New Museum um, with a bunch of scholars and artists and filmmakers, some more famous architects, uh, curators, and uh, some local tech mavens. Um, and, and began with Mark Wigley giving a talk about how we were setting up the whole project. The idea being that this dinner was actually kind of a think tank in itself. Um, and so the whole night we were kind of uh, postering these images of, of motion around the walls to see if we could get people to kind of come up with a 21st century idea of motion. So we made a book and handed it out as a kind of takeaway. Um, and we even got them to go down a slide to start the night. So the Karsten Holler show was happening at the New Museum and <laughs> We got our friends to get into motion before they started the meal. Um, and we actually built a custom table um, out of aluminum that we positioned in such a way that it had an inside and an outside. Um, and the inside had uh, 14 people sitting on roller chairs and the outside had 45 people sitting on static chairs. And with each course of the meal, the people on the inside rotated. So we had a kind of speed dating kind of think tank around the dinner. Um, which kind of looked like that over time. I'm actually going to skip the next one. Uh, can we skip this, actually? Thank you. Sorry. I'll, I'll send a link. You can watch that one online. Um, so then we made an ebook with 325 pages of all of our findings and decided that we were going to feed this to students to see what they could do with it. So the second part was. Um, basically a challenge given by the dean of the school to these 30 students to say, hey, this was the amazing things that happened in the 20th century. What do you think you could do if you understood motion in the 21st for the city of the 21st century? So then the design studio started. They started with a view that actually is not unlike my view right now, where three critics had to give presentations about the studios that they wished to do, and I'm actually going to uh, quickly play one of them for you. Our studio for Columbia is called Under Over Out, and it's about taking a forgotten piece of Manhattan's transportation infrastructure and stitching it back into the city. So there's an old trolley turnaround at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge, where trolleys used to come over the bridge, turn around, and go back over the bridge. But it's been abandoned for 70 years. So it's eight acres of Manhattan underground that's not used. So the studio is charged with taking that and stitching that back into the city. We want to rethink the idea of how mobility, infrastructure, transportation, social media all fuse together for a new urban space. We can, yeah. So this was just one of the studios. It was looking at an underground trolley station on the Lower East Side. Um, and so when we kicked off, we decided again to, to try to kind of have an event. So we invited the 30 students to, a, 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 again, a dinner event with um, eight designers. Um, and we placed them, we took the table that we made and we, we put it in Audi's um, forum and Park Avenue. Um, and we put it on the turntable for the cars. Um, and we had a rotating turntable, round table about the future of design as a kind of way to kick off the studios. Um, and then we sent the students around the world. So they went to uh, Rio and Beijing in Mumbai with the idea of bringing back new ideas of motion from around the world that they could apply back to their sites in New York City. Um, and these are some of the things that they come up, came up with. So this is Kelsey Lentz. Um, she had an idea of a kind of using the subway as an underground system to transfer uh, uh, bioorganic material around the city um, in a way to kind of create a, a network of parks underground under, under the city that might actually start to take over the city from, 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 from beneath. Um, and so these are a couple of slides from her proposal. Uh, Mark and Meng Yi Fan um, started with a concept sketch, which led to the idea of what if we could actually build on top of the streets? What would we do? How would we infill between buildings? Um, and so they came up with a kind of master plan idea with a series of prototypes that would actually come up with new ways of building on top of the streets, um, as opposed to just thinking of them as arteries for cars. Um, Shuning Zhao and Paul Tran had the idea that if you actually built bigger and took up bigger swaths of land with buildings that lightly touched the ground, um, you could have much more open space um, rather than building space, especially if you started to squeeze down the amount of space dedicated to cars with the streets. 
Um, and so this is an aerial view of what they came up with. Um, they also had the idea that if you let cars become domesticated, they could actually go inside buildings and become kind of like uh, horizontal elevators. Um, Mitch came up with the idea of the water sparrow, which is a kind of leisure platform that could be parachuted down into the water. Um, would anchor itself as it opened and would allow people to turn the, the, waterfront, the, the, the waterfront into a kind of uh, public space. Um, so the third part, um, and I'll, I'll wrap up shortly, is the public interface, which was actually the main part that my partner and I were involved in, and it had two parts. One was we gave everybody a Tumblr blog. So every student had their own blog to kind of cultivate the kind of audience that they wanted to show the work that they were doing throughout the semester um, with the idea that we would curate a, a, a blog that kind of would pull from this to show the world what these, what these people have been doing. Um, and what we realized was uh, we, we went back and started to create, you know, uh, collect the kind of back catalog of the motion images that we had missed and started to put them on the, the Tumblr blog. Um, and then we started to come into the contemporary and started to find some really cool stuff from photography and architecture and sport and music, uh, fashion and dance, and realized that actually these images just killed on Tumblr. People loved them. Um, and so as we went, you can barely see it, but actually on the left, we started to infuse the student work with these images that were starting to become closer to kind of viral content. So we actually had, on the left there, just over 200 people said, I like this, or I kind of want to put it in my own space. Um, and then this is where everything changed. My partner, Chris uh, Barley, blogged this, and 18,000 people reblogged it onto their posts. And we realized that we had kind of cracked the code, that Tumblr loves motion. It loves animated GIFs, and this was actually the constituent part of our entire project. Um, so we got really good at making viral Tumblr content. Each of these had over five or 10,000 people said, I like this. This is a 12-year-old boy uh, recreating a Beyonce video. <laughs> And then we posted this one, and we thought it was just like all the other ones, and this one got 344,000 notes. And the number of people that were following us just kind of exploded. Um, and so now we had this content stream of viral content woven in with student content. Um, a huge audience of followers, and we're one of the, recognized as one of the top 10 GIF contributors on all of Tumblr, all of its 80 million blogs around the world. Um, actually beat out with that strategy a number of different Audi websites. I'm gonna flash that one quick before I get in trouble. Um, and then all of a sudden we had 1,600 people grabbing student work and responding to it and reblogging it and commenting on it and so on. And so it became a kind of way of doing a public interface. So in, in 30 seconds I'll just talk about, oh, and it actually made it into the media, some of the projects. So in 30 seconds, the last part. So we had a kind of online public interface and then an offline public interface where we started working with the guys that were actually trying to propose a public park in the Delancey Underground, the trolley station that the, the video showed that the students were actually working on as well. And they had raised $150,000 on Kickstarter to do an exhibition. Um, and so we kind of, this is the Delancey Underground. Um, it's actually a, 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 the, the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area. It's actually getting re, re, rebuilt. And so they found this space just above it to do an exhibition. Um, they were gonna do this. Um, to show their underground park kind of in place. And they gave us this little spot over to the right. Um, and so we came up with the idea of, uh, again, taking a page out of our own playbook, a 50-foot long model of Manhattan showing all of the transportation infrastructure um, in the model um, and also incorporating all of the work of the students um, into these kind of repurposing them as animated GIFs. So um, I'm just gonna stop there. Um, and actually, a number of these images are available outside. So the, 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 the partnership with Arts Access and GSAP, the Souvenirs from the Future Project, um, we have this idea of a kind of uh, 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 green screen step and repeat. So come and get your picture taken um, in front of a, sorry? Oh, I thought I heard something. In front of it, uh, I guess it's a white screen actually, but find the white screen. You can get your picture taken, go up with your friends and your fellow alumni, um, and you can actually choose one of the images to be placed into. So the idea being that if these are the images of the future by the architects of the future, um, why don't you take a quick visit there and then come back with a souvenir? So there'll be some students outside to, to descri describe the process to you. Thanks very much.
Troy, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. My application for GSAP will be on your desk Monday morning. Uh, I just, I think the state of the university is phenomenal, and judging by the alums that are here tonight and the presentations and this, what the students are able to do, we should all give Columbia a big round of applause and also all our speakers. Now I'm the one that stands between you and food and drink. So uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I want to thank the uh, Columbia staff, uh, without which, um, without whom, uh, this evening wouldn't be possible. So thank you, everyone. And um, now please join us at the CAA Arts Access Exhibition and Reception directly outside the auditorium on the stage level. So please come down and I believe exit stage right. Is that correct? There you go. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>